This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Whether you love true crime or comedy, celebrity interviews or news, you call the shots about what's in your podcast queue. And guess what? Now you can call them on your auto insurance too with the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. It works just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance and they show you coverage options that'll fit your budget. Get your quote today at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. Hey there, mom and daughter fighting listeners. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know about a story coming up a little later in the show. It's from our partners at Macy's. In its work for the nonprofit APIA Scholars, Macy's is committed to making a difference in the lives of Asian and Pacific Islander students across the country. From May 1st to the 31st, you can support APIA Scholars by rounding up your Macy's in-store purchase or donating online. These funds will equip Asian and Pacific Islander American students with the tools and resources they need to prepare for academic, personal, and professional success. Stick around to hear from Noor, an APIA Scholar. Welcome to Mom and Dad are Fighting, Slate's parenting podcast for Monday, May 1st, the Middle School Magic Edition. I'm Jamila Lemieux, a writer, contributor to Slate's Care and Feeding Parenting column, and mom to Naima, who is 10, and we live in Los Angeles. I'm Zach Rosen, host of another show. It's called The Best Advice Show, and I am dad to Noah, who is five and a half, and Ami, who's two and a half. We live in Detroit. I'm Elizabeth Newcamp. I write the homeschool and family travel blog, Dutch Dutch Goose. I'm the mom of three littles, Henry, who's 11, Oliver, who's eight, and Teddy, who's six. We live in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Today on the show, Elizabeth will be talking with author and educator Chris Baum about his new book, Finding the Magic in Middle School. Yes, it was wonderful because I have one headed to middle school. And as you hear, Chris firmly believes that middle schoolers are misunderstood and we as parents should not be dreading these years. We should be looking forward to them, which was kind of music to my ears. So he has a lot of advice about maintaining relationships and helping middle schoolers flourish. It's a really fun discussion and I can't wait for y'all to hear it. This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and Macy's. Hey y'all, what's up? It's your girl, Lene Vanee. I'm a writer, creator, and a change maker. And when you're a young adult, so much important change begins with access to higher education and resources. And that's why Macy supports APIA Scholars. It's a nonprofit devoted to the academic, personal, and professional success of Asian and Pacific Islander Americans. And it's on a mission to support young adults like Noor. My name is Noor Ali, and I am an APIA Scholar. The way that I grew up, I was a low-income first-generation college student. APA scholars played such a big part of my undergraduate career. The scholarship actually like gave a really good boost to my savings and just made me not worried about any unexpected costs like my laptop breaking or me needing a new textbook. I've been able to get a mentor through the API scholarship mentorship program who has been guiding me through graduate applications. My goal is to pursue a doctorate in clinical psychology with focus on like mental health for Asian Americans and other underserved communities. When you run up your Macy's purchase, you're not just supporting APIA scholars, but you're supporting the Asian American community. Now's the time to support APIA scholars like Noor. This May, Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month, when you round up your purchase at Macy's or donate online, you'll help fund access to leadership development programs, mental health support, and peer mentorships through APIA scholars. Give back and learn more at Macy's.com slash purpose. Just recently, I learned that my mother, who is an artist, she was a teacher, she is a grant writer. I just learned that she almost became a nurse when she was much younger. I had no idea. The way I learned this is because last year for Mother's Day, I got her a subscription to StoryWorth. Make Mother's Day extra special for your mom or mother figure this year. Give her a unique, heartfelt gift that'll truly make her feel special and loved. The gift of StoryWorth. StoryWorth is an online service that helps you and your loved ones preserve precious memories and stories for years to come. My mom's book is in the process of being bound right now. I'm so excited to see it. It's just such a great gift. I can't recommend it enough. I also got it from my dad for Father's Day last year. Give all the moms in your life a unique, heartfelt gift you'll cherish for years. 
StoryWorth. Right now, for a limited time, you'll save $10 on your first purchase when you go to storyworth.com slash mom and dad. That's S-T-O-R-Y-W-O-R-T-H dot com slash mom and dad to save $10 on your first purchase. Storyworth.com slash mom and dad. We're back, and I'm now joined by author and educator Chris Baum. Chris, can you tell us a little more about who you are? Hi, I'm Chris Baum, and I've had the pleasure of working with middle schoolers who I think are the most underappreciated humans on the planet for about 20 years, and wrote this book, Finding the Magic in Middle School, to help people change the story. As we have really terrible expectations of middle school, and sometimes we make those come true as a result. So this book and my work is about changing that based on understanding the neuroscience of middle schoolers. Well, Chris, I am so glad you're here because, as listeners know, I just now have a middle schooler. I have a, uh, my oldest has just turned 11 and will start sixth grade next year. And all of my friends, we are like dreading this. I feel like we have felt like it is the <laughs> the end of something or the beginning of something else. And your book was such a welcome perspective because I was like, no, it, it, I mean, it is an end and a beginning and we're going to talk about that, but it's something that we can really view as beautiful. Thank you. I'm so glad to hear. That's the, what I'm hoping for. And exactly, it's a time of transformation, you know, second only to early childhood. So if we see it as that, and we understand what's going on, so it's not quite as bewildering to us, it might actually be good. How did you end up working with middle schoolers in the first place? You know, I think like a lot of people, probably because of the bad reputation, it was not my plan. <laughs> I went into, <laughs> I went to college thinking, I'm, I'm not sure what I'll do, but I'm certain it won't be anything in education because thank God I'm done with that and I'm going to do something totally different. So of course, uh, inevitably, I ended up in education as I started to realize <laughs> you know, any of the things I hope to do in the world, ultimately, I think the people who can carry change the longest and are most open to it are kids. So to make a very long story short, I signed up to be a student teacher, had no idea what I was getting myself into, and they popped me into a seventh grade science classroom, and the rest is history. Do you have like a favorite memory or, you know, one of those core memories from your middle school days? <laughs> you know, I I have a lot of, frankly, not great memories from middle school. Like, for me, it it felt kind of like a wasteland. Yeah. And I say that, you know, with hesitation, because I know there were great educators around me. But I, I was in a school where there wasn't a lot of social emotional learning as part of it, I felt lost, and also bored. And that just defined it, you know, all yeah. the way through maybe until sophomore year of high school, something started to shift for me. But I just thought that's how everybody thinks middle school is. And and maybe that is actually how most people think it is. <laughs> but then, you know, through actually teaching and, and designing schools and running schools, you know, all serving this age, I really now believe very strongly that is not how it has to be. And it's possible to really change that whole story. You talk about middle schoolers as having great possibility and potential and call it a magical time. But why do parents and I guess even some educators struggle to see them? <laughs> as, as these balls of potential. Yeah, you know, so many reasons. I think two big ones. One is that we have our own trauma f often from those years, and it's painful to go back to it, you know, just to remember the, the messiness of it. Sometimes we want to distance ourselves. Um, and the other is that you know, there's a lot in common between middle school and the toddler years. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't mean that as a disrespect to middle schoolers. Like the, the connection is that those are the two peak times of brain growth in our entire lives. And when that much change is happening, it's confusing to be the person changing and it's equally confusing to be the parent of that person. And if you think about with toddlers, like if we didn't have a way to developmentally understand what they're going through, we would go bananas. <laughs> like, yeah. why are they doing this? And I think with middle schoolers, actually, we commonly don't have any developmental foundation. So it just seems like they're being difficult for the sake of being difficult or they're checking out because who knows what's going to happen to them now. But if you understand the development at play, you realize all of this has a really good reason and there are ways to support it so they don't get stuck in that in-between stage. The core of your book talks about the developmental river, which I just let, I was like, okay, this is something I can keep in my brain. <laughs> like, which branch of this river are we on as we go through these things? Yeah. So everything in, in middle school starts with the premise that your brain is getting a total renovation and it's turning into a social brain. 
And it doesn't mean elementary schoolers aren't social, but they don't pick up social nuance, you know, inclusion, <laughs> exclusion, hierarchy, how they're going to be perceived. Most of them are just not worrying about that. Um, come middle school, you know, starting a little bit different based on which gender and when puberty begins, they suddenly start receiving all this information. I'm noticing, you know, what's going on with this group. I'm noticing this hierarchy going on over here. And then I'm not sure if it's okay to be me. Like, what is going to happen if I show this interest um, or if I become friends with this person? So that social brain has, I think, three core drives. And there's really interesting research behind each of these. But in a nutshell, it's the quest for identity, for authentic identity, the quest for connection to really understand how to be around peers, make friendships, repair friendships, and the quest for contribution to feel like a valuable person because I did something of value for an objective person, not just, you know, my parents or my teacher. Mm -hmm. That's what middle school really should be about. If we designed it around that as parents or teachers, we would see a really different kind of middle schooler. How, so, so much of what you're saying, and I think when I first started reading the book sounded like, okay, this is kind of like mini high school, right? Like these are the starting things, but you really make the point that this is fundamentally different. Yeah, I think often this is the challenge with middle school is that people say like, can I lump it in with high school or should I just lump it in with elementary? And really it's neither of those. It's its own very distinct developmental phase. And the key again is that it is when you become a social person. Even Maria Montessori said basically exactly that more than a hundred years ago. And now there's a ton of neuroscience to kind of back up that claim, but everything about it is figuring out how to be a human around other humans and how to bring yourself out and do something useful around other humans. So if you play to that, then you realize like you want to let them have lots of social time, but also you want to let them have a space where they can process what they're learning socially and they can make mistakes. Um, You want to model that as an adult, we are still learning socially. We make social mistakes. We have repairs that are needed sometimes in our relationships. Mm -hmm. If we can give them those kinds of tools, This is the best developmental window in life to understand how to be a human around other humans. And that's a pretty useful skill (laughs) to have going forward, high school and beyond. Can you give some strategies to help connect and and build trust with this age group? Because I do think that's where parents struggle, right? Like we think of them that they're going to be difficult and we get in these fights with them. And at the end of the day, like not only have we had this fight, we've we have this relationship problem. (laughs) Yeah, it's so true. You know, one of the simplest ones that I I love to say, it's called the third thing. And the idea is, you know, middle schoolers spend a lot of cognitive time and energy reading faces and actually really trying to understand what is someone actually thinking maybe that they're not saying. There's fascinating research about how right at the start of middle school, they get way better at actually seeing through us, basically, and seeing our true feelings, even if it's not what our words are saying. So when you are face to face with them, often it's kind of anxiety producing. You know, you're staring at them. They feel like they have to be looking at you. What am I supposed to say next? The silence is awkward. What is she actually thinking? Whereas if you can be side by side, both looking at something else or doing something else together, which is the third thing, it's a much lower stress, lower stakes way for them to connect. So whether it's, you know, in carpool or doing a puzzle together or even just simply watching a show together, but commenting on it, like making that part of the conversation I know a lot of middle school parents that say that's when they get to talk about relationships and sexuality. It's not a face-to-face conversation, but it's commenting on something that you're seeing portrayed. So that's the first place I would start. Yeah, that's awesome. I have kind of always called that windshield time. Like, uh, I like <laughs> that. I'm not looking at them, but it's like we do end up having these great conversations. And you're right, it's because they don't have to look at me. <laughs> yeah. And it's just a different, it's part of this, you know, bigger metaphor in the book of, you know, if you see them as someone who's going on a big adventure, like an adventure that will totally change you. And you imagine like if you were going on a huge wilderness trek, like yeah. you're not going to, you don't want to hire a boss to come along with you. who's going to be constantly telling you what to do, not to do. Like you do want to hire someone authoritative though, someone who's a, a great guide, but who is there to orient you, to prevent you from doing anything, you know, irrevocably stupid, but not to constantly nudge you. And I think that's more what they need. So it's a chance for us also to really shift who we are as parents. And I'm right there with you. My oldest one is 10. So all of this is happening. And I've been working with this age for so long, but now it's in my own household. So I'm 
I feel it. Like the way that I've parented before is not the way I need to parent now. I I struggle with that guidance to like autonomy support um <laughs> like a lot. Yeah, you know, I love this concept. Um, there's a, a type of cognitive bias called the anchoring effect that I talk about in the book. And yeah. the idea is that, you know, we all tend to value the early information we get about someone more than later information. Mm-hmm. So that explains, you know, first impressions and why they really do matter. But in this case, the challenge is as a parent, like you've seen them when they were tiny and defenseless, and you've seen them when you would never let them cross the street alone. And so we tend to be anchored on who they used to be. Mm. And we're kind of lagging behind reality, whereas they are looking ahead and they're probably overestimating their skill. They might be looking up to slightly older kids thinking, I'm basically like them. You know, I'm practically an adult. Yeah. And the gap between those two creates a lot of tension, like real painful difficulties, I think, in families where middle schoolers don't feel trusted if Mm -hmm. adults are constantly not giving them the responsibility they think they're ready for. So I think the simple, you know, advice I'd give is that whatever you think is a comfortable amount of responsibility to trust your child with is probably too little that Mm. your, your, your comfort zone is going to hold them back most likely. And it doesn't mean you need to let them do everything, give them the keys to the car, but just a degree more than feels most comfortable for you probably makes up for that bias. That's I'm such a sucker for like rules of thumb. So I love that. <laughs> like, okay, here's where I'm comfortable. Can I give a little bit more? <laughs> right? Yeah, right? Just one uh, step more. Can yeah. Make a and difference. then next time, maybe it's one more step, right? Like, okay, they've done this. Um, I think one of the things I hear also that you address is, is parents are feeling like they're losing this connection. You know, we connected with our kids as a certain way when they were elementary school and we're the parent. And now we're kind of moving into these, this new phase. How can we generate connection in this middle school phase? I think the first thing I'd suggest is to be, be careful about uh, taking things personally So it's part of their natural development to want to push off a little bit from family. And it's not because they're rejecting you so much, even though it really feels like that often. It's that they have absorbed so much from you already, values, mindset, worldview. And now they're realizing that there's this whole world of peers that has rules they don't totally understand, but they're really curious about. So they're orienting toward that because that's where their learning edge is. They already know you and trust you. Mm. So if you can see, you know, if they say, drop me off two blocks away from the middle school, you know, don't show your face. (laughs) If you can translate that in your mind as they have to figure out how to be around their friends and peers are who they're going to be with for the rest of their lives. Um, They already trust me. They trust me enough that they can give, you know, blunt requests like that. Uh, I'm not going to take it personally. I know that this is a phase and they'll come back around once they've done their developmental work, which is to figure out how to be around peers. So that might be the first step just so that we don't end up reacting or getting triggered when it's not helpful. Yeah. Someone once told me to think of that as like their first steps. Like if we treated those moments like, like, yes, (laughs) my kid. (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> told me to exactly. drop them off two blocks. They're embarrassed by me. <laughs> it's happening. They're comfortable enough to tell me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. My wife tells a story where her, her father sat her down, I think, in fourth grade and said, like, pretty soon you're going to start to be embarrassed by us. Like, I just want to warn you that that's coming. And at the time she was like, no, that's impossible. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, sure enough, two years later, she thought her parents were, you know, humiliating to be around. But she remembered that they had kind of forecast that and that made them somehow less stupid in her eyes and let her see that this is a phase. I'm not, you know, doing something wrong by turning toward peers. You know, another myth about middle schoolers is sort of that all of a sudden they're not into learning or that school becomes kind of this burden. How can we as parents help our kids stay engaged and excited about learning during this phase? This is a hard one because it's a design problem in how middle schools are set up. Middle schools accidentally are working directly against the developmental drives of middle schoolers, at least in a traditional setup. You know, they want to be around peers, to be collaborating, to feel like they're contributing, that it's a real world problem. And the reality is often they're taught individually you know, it's cheating if you're sharing notes with someone else. It can feel like busy work or worksheets. It's not mm-hmm. real world relevant. So it shouldn't be a surprise that in that kind of situation, middle schoolers feel like this is not 
design for me. Um, so the ideal solution and the hardest one to do is to design better middle schools. And those do exist. And I think when you see schools that are project-based, that have a big focus on social-emotional learning, not as some scripted curriculum, but actually mm -hmm. space where we can talk about what's going on inside and the quality of our relationships and get tools, in those schools, you see middle schoolers really engaged. They don't lose the connection. Um, for parents who don't have the choice or the privilege to go to a school like that, it's more, can you find places in their lives where that kind of learning is possible? It could be clubs or after school activities or some group where they have an advisory like experience mm -hmm. where they can talk to peers, but there's an adult facilitating it and really be honest. Like, I don't know what to do. I, I have a crush on someone and this is really awkward and what, what's supposed to happen next? Or I'm screaming at my mom and I don't like how that's going. And what yeah. am I supposed to change about that? They really need spaces to process that. It's, that's where a lot of their biggest learning is. Well, I am just so thrilled you could share this time with us to talk about this book. I hope, um, lovely listeners, that you go pick this up and you too can see the magic in middle school because, I don't know, this book changed my perspective. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to hear that. And here's to changing the story. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Hey, listeners, whether you love true crime or comedies, celebrity interviews, news, or even motivational speakers, you call the shots on what's in your podcast queue, right? And guess what? Now you can call the shots on your auto insurance, too. Enter the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. The Name Your Price tool puts you in charge of your auto insurance by working just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance, then they'll show you a variety of coverages that fit within your budget, giving you options. Now that's something you'll want to press play on. It's easy to start a quote, and you'll be able to choose the best option for you, fast. It's just one of the many ways you can save with Progressive Insurance. Quote today at Progressive.com to try the Name Your Price tool for yourself and join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company & Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. National Geographic presents... What I'm asking you to do is dangerous. You need to take your time to think it through. No, I don't. What do I do? We can't save everyone. But if I don't try, I don't think I'll be able to live with myself. What are we supposed to do? Some stood by. Anything. You have to. She stood up. There has to be a line. Fel Pauli is me, Geese. There has to be me for this to work. A Small Light limited series premieres tonight at 9. Stream on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. All right, Guardians. On May 5th. Let's give the galaxy one more show. I'm... No, not like that. Dude. No. Get hooked. Hooked on a feeling. On a feeling. May as well have a little fun, huh? Hooked on a feeling. All over again. I am... Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. People on Earth die when they're like 50. Are you about to die? I'm not 50. Rated 13 may be inappropriate for children under 13. May 5th. Get tickets now. All right, let's move on to recommendations. Zach, what are you recommending this week? So I was going to do a very Mad F centric recommendation and talk about this new learning tool that's been great, but I'm going to save that because this morning I saw that someone captured video of Talking Heads frontman David Byrne singing When Doves Cry um, at a karaoke bar, I guess in New York City, and it is just 27 seconds but it like is so great if you love prince and the talking heads and I, I always love like those like you know bill murray sighting stories but there's just something about david byrne wearing just a zip-up hoodie out in the world <laughs> singing prince you just have to watch it it's it's 27 seconds and it made my day like three times better um so we're gonna put a link to that in the show notes check do it you out. think this is his Go to karaoke song? It's a great question. Like, I just wouldn't have ever thought that David Byrne would be at a tiki bar singing karaoke. That's what um, I'm saying. It sounds so good. Like, he does, like, a high harmony in it. I just want to, like, stop this recording now and keep watching it. Highly recommend. Fun. All right. Elizabeth, what are you recommending? Okay. Well, I am prepping starting to prep we have a big trip coming up and then we'll be home for a couple days before we move so i'm starting to kind of prep all that stuff for um the kids to do on these long flights uh 
And I completely forgot, I don't think I've recommended this before, but these Professor Noggin cards are some of our favorites. It's mm. a, it's a little game, and they come in themed packs, and you um, it comes with a dice, and you roll the dice and ask whatever questions. I don't do any of that. Uh, to, to do it my way, you need the cards, you need a hole punch, and you need a binder ring. And when you get the cards, you're going to hole punch in the corner of all of them and put them on a bind- binder ring. And then I attach them like to my purse or to my bag or whatever. And as we're waiting in line or whatever, I just ask the questions and I hand them to the kids and let them read me the hard questions and see if we know them. Sometimes I mix the packs all up so the questions are all over the place. Sometimes uh, we're like doing a space study now. So I just hole punched the space ones this morning to bring around with us. Um, They're such a great way to eat a couple of minutes and the challenging questions are challenging enough that uh, adults don't always know them. So that's fun for kids uh, and the kids really like them. They have beautiful pictures on the front that are relevant to the thing. They have so many different ones. So go check them out. Professor Noggin cards. Very cool. Super cool. I'm looking at the website now. These look really interesting. Can you get this stuff at the library? Do you know? So sometimes I can find some of these things at the library. Um, These cards in particular are very popular on like anybody selling homeschool curriculum. Uh, I find a lot of the stuff that way because you use them a couple times. The kids know the answers and people sell them for a couple dollars. So if you Mm -hmm. like kind of educational games, like your Facebook homeschool group is a really good place actually to be because people are always uh, selling these things. And most libraries hold like curriculum swaps and and stuff like that. But I'd say um, our library has an educational resource room and they have a ton of these there, but you can't take them home, but you can go there and use, they have so many games and, and we probably use that, um, you know, once or twice a month, we go there with the whole group and see what they have. That's relevant that we, you know, is relevant to one lesson that you wouldn't use more than a couple times. Mm-hmm. Very nice. Cool. How about well, you, Jamila? I've got an adult recommendation again this week. Um, I'm recommending Florida Man on Netflix. It's I think it's a limited series. I can't see it coming back. Uh, it's about this guy. He's caught up with some gambling debt, and he's working for this kind of mobster-like guy. And he is sent to Florida to recover the guy's girlfriend. She's run off from him. And it turns out that the guy and the girlfriend have been having an affair. But also, the the lead guy is a one-time cop who went crooked. And he's got, like, an ex-wife who's a straight cop. She's, like, trying to investigate this case that he's adjacent to. And so she's kind of investigating him. And so even though he still, like, really cares about her and they still care about each other, like, she also potentially could send him to jail and seems like she's interested in doing it. Hmm. And it's just really interesting. It's, you know, it's short. It moves fast. Um, I enjoyed it. It's a fun show. And it's also... um, inspired in part by the uh, stereotypical Florida man. You know, you hear these ridiculous stories about someone in Florida committing some sort of absurd crime. Kind of like quir- um, quirky and deranged. Have, yes. Time. Have you done the thing yes. where you Google a Florida man and then like your your birthday? <laughs> no, I haven't. Wait, what do you oh, mean? God. Like your dirt, like Florida man, Florida July man 22nd. Just put in your birthday. <laughs> And it'll just tell you, like, whatever crazy... It'll pull up, like, a headline from a Florida... Headline. (laughs) Oh, my God. That's a game. That is a really good game. I love that. I'm going to do that. (laughs) Mine is Florida man hit dad in face with pizza after learning he helped deliver him, police say. (laughs) There's so many for game. I don't want to offend Florida people, though. A Florida man was arrested after telling a playground full of kids where babies come from. (laughs) Oh, my God. Florida man arrested on DUI charge after driving scooter into Walmart shelves. <laughs> nice. To be fair, I learned of this game in Florida. <laughs> from a, from, from a local? Florida okay. people. <laughs> okay, so, it's, well, so, so we're allowed to Obviously, everyone plays it because when you type Florida man into Google, birthdays start popping up. Okay, wow. <sighs> That's this another is recommendation, playing the, this game. You can that is a bonus recommendation. Pair it with the TV show. Great. <laughs> Excellent. 
Um, cool. Well, finally, it is time to open our mailbag. Our two touched out for sex episode last Thursday seemed to strike a chord, and we wanted to share a few pieces of advice. Warning, this, as you may have guessed, is not for little ears. Hi, mom and dad are fighting. Longtime listener, first time writer. This episode resonated with me so much that I felt compelled to write. I am six years postpartum and still struggle with intimacy with my partner. There are a lot of reasons for this. Tired after a long day of work and parenting, body image issues, poor eating and exercise habits, feeling like I give, give, give all day and just need time to myself at night, etc. What compelled me to write today is that after listening to your episode, I asked myself a few important questions. Do I enjoy having sex? Yes, I, I do. It feels good. So why don't I ever initiate it? And always say no when my partner initiates. Also, I feel like our family is reaching another phase. My son is now six and doesn't require as much of me, so I can focus on other things for me. I hope by prioritizing my own overall health, it will improve my mental health and give me more energy and desire to have sex. I also realize that I need to do better at communicating how I'm feeling to my partner. So thank you again for this episode. It has motivated me to talk to my partner about where I'm at now and how I'm feeling. Hmm. Thanks for being so introspective in your um, answer. And mm-hmm. I actually was really struck that she was like, you know, wrote in and said, like, do I enjoy having sex? Yes, I do. Because I don't know that we necessarily touched on that. But like, yeah, it, you know, that can be totally separate from these feelings. And we don't ever sit down and think, like, is this something I enjoy? We just think, like, there's too much there's too much other stuff going on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm glad the conversation sparked something in you. Me too. We've got another letter. Hi, all. First, love the show and always enjoy the conversations. Second, I wanted to maybe offer some advice. I'm a mom of two, in which both births were traumatic, and I had PPD, PPA after both. My OB put me on meds, and while they helped my mental state enough, it killed my sex drive. I'm now on two low-dose medications, and I can't get enough of my husband. Also, schedule days to yourself. You stated you have help and your husband is an active partner, so schedule a day a month that is all you. As far as your body, that is a journey I am on as well, but knowing that my husband has seen me at my absolute worst, according to me, and still wants to throw me on the bed is amazing. As a mom of two girls, I don't want them to have the bad self-talk that I have. I want them to know their body doesn't define them as a person, so I do all I can to correct my bad talk. Also, I agree that talking and opening up to your husband about your struggles will do a lot. While he'll never understand it fully, he won't know unless you tell him. My husband offered no sex for a period after our first. The ball was in my court, so it took the pressure off the other intimacy, like kissing and cuddling. It was three months, but one day I finally said go, and it was great. I just know how hard this is, and how alone you can feel. Good luck. We have the best listeners. This is awesome. We do. I think just knowing you're not alone, right? Because I I think that is part of it, is that you just feel so alone and like, who am I supposed to talk to about this? So Mm -hmm. way to support each other, guys. Well, if you have any thoughts, advice, or questions of your own, send it in. We love getting these letters. And thank you so much to the folks who wrote us today. Send us an email at momanddadislate.com or leave us a voicemail at 646-357-9318. This episode of Mom and Dad Are Fighting is produced by Rosemary Belson and Mara Curry. Shasha Leonard is the voice of our listeners. Alicia Montgomery is VP of Slate Audio. For Zach Rosen and Elizabeth Newcamp, I'm Jamila Lemieux. Thanks for listening. Hey everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe now.